Namo Amida Butz. Namo Amida Butz. Namo Amida Butz. Welcome to Buddhism 123. These talks on Buddhism 123 will be a little different than our Sunday Dharma talks. These talks should be a little more educational and inform us as to Shin Buddhism and how we might put these principles into practice. A few weeks ago we started with Buddhism and realizing that it is a religion, a philosophy, a way of life, but may be viewed a little differently from other Western religions. When the Buddha was seeking his answer to truth, he looked around because to seek truth it was a way that he felt could help to alleviate human problems. And when he looked at the earth, he realized there were two things that were true. One is that everything is impermanent, that is, everything changes. And with everything in dynamic motion, it means that the now is the most important moment. Not so much the future nor the past, but each moment, the now, the present moment. The second thing he realized was that everything was interdependent. There was no separate entity that was separate from the whole. And with this interdependence, uh, we now know, because of the science of atoms and molecules and such, that throughout the world and universe, everything depends on the other and affects the other. And so what is important here is relationship. Not only our relationship to each other, but also to the elements of the earth. Now, our discontent, he realized, was that as humans, we tend to neglect these things of impermanence and interdependence. We like some changes and we don't like others. We like some relationships and we don't like others. And so, the human mind only sees a small portion of true reality. And so, for those who wanted to follow the Buddhist teachings at that time, they became monks and nuns, and people can still do that today. But as normal working people who live in a world of commerce and social life, uh, these things are difficult to really diminish the sense of the self. And so we have Shin Buddhism. Now, there are two elements of Buddhism that may be a little more unique than Western religions. And one is this thing called duality. We don't look at good over bad, right over wrong so much as balance. That the sense of duality can never be resolved one side over the other. That's where you see Congress being in kind of a deadlock in many issues. But it is a sense of balance. The other thing is that there's no judgment at the end of life to determine how our eternity will be spent. The important part is the journey each moment. So these are two things to keep in mind as we progress through our explanations. Now, Shin Buddhism, we said this particular school of which this temple is a part, there have been three things that have made it a little difficult to understand. And one is that it was formulated in the 13th century feudal Japan. And now we're in 21st century digital America. So there's this vast difference of time where people looked at the world when the earth was flat, and now we know that it's universal and we live in this digital age where it's hard for me to figure out how my phone works. A second difficulty of learning about Jin Buddhism is the difference of cultures. Words and ideas have a different meaning in the East as it does in the West. And the third thing, which we'll talk about today, is the difference between words and experience. Words are symbolic and point to an object or experience, but they're different things. Now, today we want to talk about Practice and process. Practice is very important. Practice embodies something. It makes words or ideas real. It gives us a physical dimension to these things. And practice is true in all things, in sports and in anything we do. We start off with something simple. We continue to practice or repeat it. And we learn until it becomes a more natural thing. But again, practice is something that makes ideas into a real experience. Now, I have a master's degree in transpersonal spiritual psychology. And when I went to school at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, a beginning course of the first year was Aikido. Aikido is a martial art of Japan where one learns to work with an opponent and uses the other's energy to throw him or to get him off balance. Now, 
Why would Aikido be a core course in the first year of psychology school? As a therapist, you learn to work with people. There's a therapist and a client. And it's basically a dance where you're working with that other person. However, when we take Aikido as a physical sport, we have the actual feel of how the other person's energy is. You're working back and forth. It's called musubi. Musubi is also a term that physics make this rice ball, making a rice ball. But you're working with another, feeling their experience. And so having this physical experience of Aikido can really help a therapist when he learns to work with a client to really feel what that other person is feeling. So again, this is an important part of, of experience versus words. Now, a particular thing about Japanese martial arts is that the point is not to beat the opponent. The point is to develop oneself. And we have the opportunity of having an opponent help us develop ourselves. So again, it's not to defeat someone, but to learn more and to develop the self. Now this word practice. I was a dentist, and as a dentist, I practiced. Now, in dental school, I practiced and learned dentistry. You would think that after graduation and becoming a, a dentist, I wouldn't have to practice. But what I did was open my own practice, and I continued to practice. And the same is true in medicine and law. Practice is a means of incorporating something and doing it, never reaching an end point, but always improving oneself. And so again, this is another aspect of practice. Now, in Shin Buddhism, the most important thing that we know is that we call ourselves the Temple of the Primal Vow. In Japanese, it's called Honganji. And this comes from the larger sutra, in which the historical Buddha told the story about a bodhisattva named Dhammakara, who vows and fulfills 48 vows, and he becomes Amida Buddha. Now the most important vow, the 18th vow, we call the primal. And in it he says that when we recite his name and call his name, we are assured of spiritual awakening. And therefore, our main practice is to call the name Amida Buddha. And therefore we have this term Namo Amidabutsu, or the short chant, Namandab. So how does this calling the name become the main practice? Of course, we have secondary practices of meditation, chanting, attending services, and so forth. But the main practice is this Namo Amidabutsu. Now, the difference is this. It is a practice, but not to achieve a goal. It is a practice to realize what we have already received. We practice in that we repeat it until we become familiar with this. Not to achieve anything, but to realize what has been given to us, what we have received. Now, where does this come from? Shindan says this in his Hymns of the Dharma Ages. Persons who truly realize Shinjin as they utter Amida's name, being mindful of the Buddha always, wish to respond in gratitude to the great benevolence. This is the practice of recognizing what has been received. Now, I found a simple way to convey this thought is to use the word thank you. I think we all understand and have an experience of thank you. It's what we say when we realize we have received the gift. Thank you is uh, common in all cultures. I think it has been true uh, in many centuries. And it's something that has an experience behind it. We have a feeling, an emotion, a sense of gratitude. It does connect us with the other. and so. Thank you it doesn't have to be explained. It is an experience we already have. So how does thank you become a spiritual practice? In the Karate Kid, the movie, the original one, it shows that the boy Daniel wants to learn Aikido. Aikido is, uh, I mean, uh, Karate. And he first is uh, instructed to polish a car and then to paint the fence. And he's a little disgusted because he's wondering why all this work in polishing the car or painting the fence, what this has to do with karate. Later he finds that these movements of his hands are fundamental in the art of karate. And so he learns that these beginning steps, although they seem unrelated, are fundamental.
to karate. And it's in that same sense that I think thank you can be used as a beginning step to the experience of Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu has been explained, but it can be difficult to get this idea across. And yet, thank you doesn't have to be explained so carefully. But it's not magical. It has to be experienced. It has to have some experience behind it. And this is where I like to suggest some methods of practicing this practice of Nembutsu or thank you in order to really begin to be on this journey of the Nembutsu. But we have to understand, thank you is just the first step. It's the opening gate. And I have found that in the last 20 years or so that I've been sharing the Shin Dharma, I've been sharing this in retreats and workshops and Dharma talks. I find that those who are unfamiliar with Shin Buddhism find this a very easy way to begin to be in the right setting, in the right attitude of receiving rather than achieving. And so remember that this practice is a practice of receiving, recognizing what we have already received, not trying to get it to a different point. Now, I have a homework that I think we should all try so that you begin to understand this, not as a thought, but as an actual experience. When uh, we're at home and isolated from others, we're asked to do one thing all the time. That's wash our hands. So the next time you're washing your hands and you turn on the faucet, say thank you. And what that should elicit is how the water got there. You're turning on the faucet and you have clean running water. That's because a plumber put, installed the sink and plumbing. Somehow plumbing got to your house because of what the city did. There's a reservoir somewhere where, again, the water has been pumped. And so there's a lot that has gone into this simple act of turning on the faucet. Saying thank you really acknowledges all that has gone before. Not only that, there's rain that's come from the ocean that's fallen on the ground that's gone into the reservoirs. So all these things have contributed to our receiving water. Saying thank you puts us in a right frame of mind of Namo Amidabutsu, appreciating the benevolence of what we call light and life, wisdom and compassion, the benefit of Amida Buddha. So with that, we'll close this session today. Next time we'll get into more detail on how we can really incorporate this practice of the number two of saying thank you. And it leads to much more. As I said, this is a practice of receiving, and it is one where we really look at others as the source of our happiness. So with that, we'll close reciting when I said the name of the Buddha, Amida. Gasho, namo amidabuts, namo amidabuts, namo amidabuts, namo amidabuts.